Okay, and then let me go ahead and start doing a screen share. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first off the bat, my name is Eric Espinosa, and I am the CEO and co-founder of Coconut VA. Um, I'm also a digital nomad, so right now I'm in an Airbnb in Mexico. So I apologize if there are any Wi-Fi lags. Uh, I think we worked out most of the issues. Uh, and you see that fish right there? No, I didn't catch it, but it is a, a beautiful uh, bluefin marlin. Um, all right. So today's webinar is going to be on how to le leverage the power of virtual assistants. Uh, we don't mean virtual assistants by uh, Amazon Alexa or by Siri. Instead, we mean uh, by remote digital assistants um, and those from the Philippines. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask anybody who has their mics on if they can go ahead and mute. Uh, and then if you have any questions uh, throughout, uh, feel free to uh, write them in the chat and we'll make sure that we go over those um, either in the webinar or near the end. So with that, a little bit of my history, um, we've got my, my co-founder Tyler uh, on this call also. Um, our previous business was Venture Validator. It was a market research firm for startups helping them to test for product market fit. And in the process of building that business, um, we were helping over a hundred other startups to uh, grow and test systems. And throughout this process, we've used virtual assistants extensively. And uh, one of the things that we've figured out is that um, as you know, our backgrounds, I was a professor at Brigham Young University in the entrepreneurship program. I had a lot of access to interns and there's a lot of benefits to interns, but there's a lot of downsides too. The, inter the interns have you know, very bright capacities and they're able to learn anything and they're also inexpensive. But the issue that we were having is that it's a revolving door. Each semester uh, you're having somebody leave and you're having them go to either a full-time job or to another internship, et cetera. And so there's, there's all this talent, all this opportunity, all these benefits, but there's this huge downside that you have this revolving door and you have to train people from scratch again and again. And so we had heard about um, virtual assistants, but we had a lot of questions. And I, I know that a lot of you on this call probably have a lot of the same questions, um, such as what country do you hire from? How much do you pay them? How do you pay them? <clears throat> what are some of the legal requirements? What are the tax laws? where do you find them, uh, what sites, et cetera, how do you vet them, uh, what can you expect as far as their English skill level, how competent are they, how do you train them, and what can they even do? So there's all these questions that are big barriers to even starting out with virtual assistants that we understood because that was us just a couple of years ago. Um, but in, in this process, we went into research mode. We started reading books and podcasts and going through courses. Uh, and even after doing all this research, it still took us a year to even try. And it really comes down to two things, and you probably relate really, to this. I was afraid of the cost, the cost of learning and the cost of making mistakes. I really didn't have the time to learn to do it right. And I really didn't have the time to mess up and the money to mess up uh, and, and get it right. Uh, and so we're going to go over this call, uh, a lot of the answers to these questions and helping people to... Um, jump through that learning curve much quicker than we did. I'm going to make sure everyone here is muted. All right. So um, continuing with this, uh, Venture Validator, our first startup uh, sold earlier this year, was acquired by Fundable Startups. Um, and kind of in, in the process of this, we were trying to figure out what next. And uh, we had this idea for Coconut VA, which is a win-win virtual assistant staffing model. Uh, this is not necessarily a sales pitch at, at the beginning of um, our, our call here, but it is really important that you understand why we have certain biases and um, why we have certain opinions on how to maximize the potential of virtual systems. I really think that we've been able to do things that no other uh, companies have been able to do with VAs, and you're going to be able to meet some of my VAs on this call after, uh, after my presentation starts, and I think you're going to see uh, what I'm talking about that. But it's important that you understand that the experience that we talk about is not a typical experience unless you do things with what we call a win-win um, staffing model. Uh, and kind of supporting that, 
we're entrepreneurs. We understood what business owners wanted, but uh, my co-founder and I, we weren't virtual assistants. And so one of the things that we did to, to understand what, uh, how can we maximize the potential of virtual assistants is we went to the Philippines and I lived with my wife for a month as a virtual assistant on our lowest paid VA salary and uh, went around working graveyard shift and getting to meet all of our wonderful team members. And that was a really big opening experience for us to understand what are their challenges and what's important to them. And it very much is different than how you would um, necessarily motivate people in the States. And so all of that um, kind of should come together in, in understanding our perspective. Uh, and if you want these same results, um, things that you would look to replicate in your own outsourcing solutions. Um, so with that, we've got um, three big things that I wanna go over in the beginning is what is a VA? What are the connotations? What are the countries? What are the roles? So again, a VA stands for virtual assistant. It, um, it gets confused with a uh, virtual assistant as in something that's an online assistant. It's just an antiquated term that really is as broad as any remote worker, typically from a different country, though you can very much have VAs from the US. So uh, the countries that you can get virtual assistants from um, are typically going to be uh, U.S. and Canada, and, and those rates are typically 35 to 50 bucks an hour. Um, or you can start uh, going to Brazil. It's where you get a lot of good graphic designers. Uh, India is where you get a lot of tech support. Um, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, you have lots of people doing Fiverr type jobs. Uh, and the Philippines is uh, our favorite country. Uh, and they um, are best known for great English, great U.S. business experience. Uh, a very trustworthy country. Uh, the scam rate is extremely low there. Um, so every, you know, when we're talking about the virtual assistant agency or the virtual assistant landscape, we're going to be today talking about the Philippines and everything that we know from there, but know that um, the diversity is as big as you uh, can imagine um, on, on that uh, realm. Uh, the other last thing I'll talk about this is connotation. Virtual assistants have the connotation that they can only do scheduling tasks, um, that they can write emails and they can do customer service and, and just the basic things that it's, it's like putting a robot uh, that's not very smart on a system. And that's the connotation they've had, which is completely ridiculous. Um, they are just as smart and just as uh, capable and have just as much potential as you or I do, uh, and sometimes even more, which is really awe-inspiring and it helps you, um, it motivates you to unlock that potential and give them uh, those same opportunities that you have. And um, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So instead of um, me telling you about the great things that virtual assistants can do, uh, I'm gonna instead just kind of put the proof in the pudding. And I've asked a couple of virtual assistants on my team to join us on this call today uh, and tell a little bit about the skills that, that they employ um, I think, Liza, if you're on this call, could you go ahead and uh, talk about your role as a customer success manager and what you do? Hi. Um, yeah, my name is Liza. So I'm, um, I'm part of the customer team, um, customer success team, and also I'm a hiring manager. So I help with the sourcing process to, ma uh, to match our clients with the best VA that will fit their requirements, as well as the, their work culture. And then I'm also, yeah, part of the client success or customer success team where I'm the one, uh, I'm actually one of the point of contacts of the clients as well as the employees. So I make sure that we attend to our clients at a timely manner and help them specifically with any billing issues that they have. So that's me. Thank you, Liza. So Liza started out uh, when, when she first um, came with us, she actually didn't have any of that experience. She was a prospector um, and she'd done a couple of different corporate gigs uh, in Manila. And we just gave her more training and said, hey, we need someone to start taking care of the customer service. Here's some training on how to do it. And she's able to pick that up. Hey, we need somebody to, to take over the billing. Here's how you do it. And so she started doing it. So anything that you can, can you, you can't look at just a VA's resume and what they've done in the past to know what their potential is. Uh, a lot of it is um, getting to know them personally, finding out what their aptitudes are, and we're really good at um, doing that, and then giving them training, and that's where they can really blossom into any role that 
uh, a US uh, person could do. Um, so yeah, really, um, we've got a lot of lead generation um, is, is a huge thing that, uh, oops, sorry, my scroll went back. Uh, with, with customer success, that's a, a big thing that people are asking. The reason why Philippines um, are really great, you can hear Liza's accent is, is quite good. Um, the Philippines was a US territory and their national sport is basketball. Uh, you go in, into the, the city of Manila, most, Manila, the most densely populated city in the world, and almost anybody you talk to can speak English to some degree. Um, you have a lot of corporations, US corporations, Citibank, Wells Fargo, all of these huge banking organizations that have had offices there for the last 20 or so years that have really been training up a huge organization of phenomenal talent. And then you have COVID happening where they're all now working from home. And again, it's the most densely populated city in the world. Now those corporations are saying, hey, we want you to come back to the office. And they're saying, I don't want to go through an hour, hour and a half of traffic. I want to work at home. So now they're starting to look for these remote jobs, which is the perfect time for us in the US to say, hey, you have experience with US customer service, you, you have the same expectations, uh, you have great accents, um, you're watching a lot of Netflix, a lot of Hulu, the same shows that we watch, you're watching, so you get not only um, just the vocabulary, you're getting the slang, and that's why I would say the Philippines is the best known country for uh, any type of customer service role. Okay, next we have is uh, lead generation, and um, I don't have anyone uh, on the call for this one, um, actually, Michael, I'm going to have you on lead generation or I'm going to have you on. Yeah, Michael, if you're on the call, actually, have you talked about lead generation? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Michael, the sales development representative for Coconut VA. So my role with the team is very simple. I do the outreach to all of our lead sources. And I also do the prospecting of our target clients. Also, I pre-qualify those leads in order to send them an invite for a strategy call with our account executive. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, so Michael has been a great asset for our team. Um, like he said, he's doing everything from lead generation, uh, warming up those leads, running email campaigns, et cetera. Um, and he's kind of a Swiss Army knife. If I wanted to put him as an account executive, um, that's something that he could also do uh, quite well. Um, so that's that's another very common role that we're asked uh, to outsource to people. Uh, next, we have general admin, and um, I've got a lot of requests that we fulfill our general admin, uh, something that Filipinos can do very well, back office, uh, whether it be data entry, whether it be um, managing uh, your website, um, it can even be you know, creating newsletter content, uh, doing things on a little bit of Canva graphic design. Um, most of our VAs are kind of a catch-all. I think that you know a lot of people have in their mind, oh, I have one specific job role that I want to outsource, but I don't have enough hours um, to warrant somebody at a 20 or a 40 hour position. And so it's hard for them to find somebody who's stable. So what you actually end up having to do is take two or three different um, mini jobs and combine it into one role. And you're trying to find someone that can fulfill all of those things. Well, general admin is, is something that a lot of people get bucketed into. Uh, one of the people on this list here uh, is Hannah. She's a general admin for Summit Venture Studio. Uh, and she has learned everything from uh, building websites to um, running uh, Facebook um, groups and running uh, surveys she's done. Um, we've had her do SEO and, and do blogs. What we'll say is, hey, Hannah, go find five blogs on this subject and then go summarize it and make your own version of the blog. And she'll do all that and then essentially get the draft up. We go over it and then we'll make a couple of edits, but she's done all the groundwork for us. So it's so much easier. We don't have to put the initial thought into it. Uh, and Hannah came out of, out of high school, actually. She had one other job for three months and uh, since then, we've just been giving her Udemy courses. We've been giving her YouTube courses. And like I said, they're, they're just as smart as you and I are. And as entrepreneurs, we're usually doing everything in our business. I bet you that as an entrepreneur, you know how to do every single role in your business, but you're not the best at it. And so the point is to try to find people that have those skills um, and uh, enable them with the same training that you've had, um, which is a lot of self-help, Googling, and YouTube. And what you can accomplish with that is quite amazing. 
Uh, okay, so graphic design and social media is another uh, task that um, is great to outsource. Um, social media is something that's probably most common where you're asking somebody to do general admin and social media, but you want them to have a graphic design eye. So it's not per se that they have to be an expert graphic designer that's done schooling and graphic design, but there are people that have the, the eye for what looks good in Canva and what doesn't. Uh, and there's such great tools with drag and drop things, Canva templates, et cetera, that um, all you need to do is say, hey, here's a brand that I want to mimic and go ahead and create this post or this flyer, this website, mimicking the feel of this brand. And uh, someone who has those skills can certainly uh, jump in and do all that. I actually have uh, Kath, she's not on here today. She's my social media manager and she runs our TikTok accounts. She's actually the face of our TikTok uh, and we'll go ahead and, and run um, all of our, our videos. She'll do uh, some of our LinkedIn content. I will say some one thing that people try to do sometimes with um, LinkedIn content that um, is not as possible is they try to outsource their own voice. Uh, that's not going to be something that is um, is as easy as you think it might be, or it's not something that you can really ask people to do because um, each one of us has our own unique voice and asking somebody to create for your company account is much different than creating for your personal brand. And so we actually, uh, we write our own content for our personal brands. We have our VAs write it for our company brands. So that is uh, something to manage as far as expectations. Uh, okay, going a little rogue here on the um, uh, Zoom slides. All right, so we have um, custom roles here from venture analysts, um, we've uh, trained, a, we've had a, a customer train a, someone to be a scrum master who had no uh, experience in running scrum before, but again, they have all the aptitude to learn that. It took him about a month and a half to learn how to become a scrum master, but now he runs all the, the team meetings with US developers and writes all the storyboards for all the features for apps that need to be developed. Uh, and then on this call, I actually have my account executive, Judy, I believe. Uh, Judy, would you like to share some of the things that you do? I'm not sure if I hear Judy hopping on or not. So if she does hop on, uh, we will have her go, I guess, in the next section. Um, let's go over to executive assistance. Uh, Donna, would you like to share um, what you do on your day to day? Sure. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, so I am Donna. I am Eric's executive assistant um, and operations manager here at Coconut VA. Um, so on the EA side, I help Eric organize his emails. Um, and also make sure that he's on top of his tasks. Um, I also block off any noise and make sure that he focuses on the tasks that he needs to complete um, for the day. So we do uh, daily sweeps is what we call it, um, just to touch base at the uh, start of the day um, to go over the tasks or to go over any urgent matters that came through his inbox. Um, on the operation side, I help out with managing um, the team and the different departments. Um, project management, and um, yeah, helping out with all the different departments within Coconut VA. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Donna is an absolute lifesaver. Um, I probably one day will have her be the CEO of the company as I move more into uh, an owner position. Uh, that's how much I look up to her and um, how much I believe in Filipino talent and the things that they can do. So thank you so much, Donna. Um, okay, here we have a, a slide with, with our org chart. So I, I've shown you quite a few members of my team. So on our, our team, um, we've got, what, two, four, six, eight people plus two founders. If you take the, the people under the founders, you take their job descriptions and you look up what it would cost to um, replicate this org structure in the U.S., it'd be $465,000 a year. But because we're able to do it in the Philippines, uh, this is only costing us $220,000 a year. So it's about a 50% savings and our costs are more expensive because we are actually providing benefits that are um, that beat out any other type of uh, agency. So that's with paying our VAs, giving them full healthcare, giving them uh, profit sharing, giving them uh, paid time off, um, paid holidays, um, and it, so the, the, the whole thing is if you can find 
talent, the arbitrage, if you can find talent and grow them up to the point where they are now equal to someone in the US, but you're compensating them in a country where their expenses aren't so uh, high and where the opportunity cost is much lower, now you're overcompensating them and they're going to be that much more uh, steady and stable with you and they're not going to leave and go find another job. So now if they're gonna be with you long-term, you can start outsourcing and treating them um, much with, with much more loyalty than uh, if you get somebody who is in the States, you know, that we have the Great Recession right now, or sorry, the Great Resignation right now, and people are job hopping. I, I think I, I saw a statistic that one in five people have changed jobs in just the last six months. So that's insane, a 20% churn, turnover in workforce. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing with, with coconut VAs, we're seeing a 1% turnover uh, in a year, which is absolutely mind boggling if you, if you look at the, the comparative. Um, so those are just some of the, the advantages and the jobs that can be done. Uh, I'm now going to delve into what are some of the um, uh, key things to know as you're looking to delegate things. So there's easier roles and there's more difficult roles to delegate. The easier roles are also going to be cheaper to de delegate to, and, and there's more difficult roles. Um, everyone that, that you've heard talk on, on the calls today, um, their rates are typically going to be between $10 and $16 an hour, uh, just to kind of give you uh, an anchor of what to expect. Uh, you certainly can find cheaper. Um, you can go down to eight. You can even find people working you know, lower than six uh, if you're not getting benefits and whatnot. But as you do that, the English quality diminishes, the experience diminishes, the turnover is going to increase. And so now you're starting to lose a lot of these benefits because you're not able to fully replace somebody that has the same impact of somebody who's in the States. So um, the easier roles, the ones that are, are more near the $10 an hour mark, those are ones that are defined. And just something that you should be aware of. Uh, and also I'll, I'll give you um, a resource. So uh, of course, I'll share Coconut DA's website, and we've got a, a, a discount link for everyone on this call. But if you'd like to do it yourself, and um, you're more of a DIY type of person, onlinejobs.ph is going to be the best website to find really good talent. Uh, I absolutely love what they do. I love their mission. Um, they're an awesome group. And uh, if you were to go on online jobs and try to find somebody, um, it takes about 200 applicants to find uh, some of the easy roles. So just know that if you put a job out there, expect 200 emails coming in and, and you've got to now source through that and find out who is using Grammarly on their, on their English and who is using a friend. And it's just really, it is a difficult process that you do have to be prepared for to do the work to find somebody. And a lot of the work is in finding the right person. But now we have more difficult roles and those are going to be the open roles that um, are more sales, they're more management. It's they, they require a lot more autonomy. And those roles are typically going to take about a thousand applicants uh, in order to find that right fit. Um, so if, if you go on online jobs and you go and you get 250 applicants and you can't find that amazing person, I don't want to hear any complaints that, oh, the talent doesn't exist. No, it exists. You just have to make sure that you compensate them really well and that you're attracting the right type of people and that your processes are right. Um, and expect that it's going to be uh, quite a bit of searching but the talent that exists there is bar none, it's amazing. Okay, um, so now we talked about uh, the rules, now let's talk about founders. There's founders who are ready, and there's founders who are not ready. Um, there's different solutions. You can go from uh, you know, piecemeal, where you're just outsourcing to, to Upwork or Fiverr, and it's, it's a one-time job that you have, or maybe it's a recurring job that is on, um, a freelancer frequency where it's like, oh, it's like six hours a, a month or six hours a week. Finding somebody on Upwork or Fiverr is probably going to be much better than uh, hiring somebody uh, full-time or part-time or using an agency full-time or part-time. If you're going to hire somebody um, for a, a steady amount of time, you need to make sure as a founder you're ready. And the biggest thing that we've seen is that the founder needs to have product market fit. You don't necessarily need to have a lot of revenue, but you do need to have product market fit. Uh, and the reason why is we come from backgrounds of venture validator where our whole networks have been pre-product market fit startups. And we've noticed that um, they will hire for a role because they'll think, oh, this is what our business model is. So we need uh, people that can do X, Y, Z skill set. And then after about a month, the business pivots and changes and nope, we're going this way. And now all of a sudden the skill sets that they've hired for and they've trained for 
are no longer needed and they actually need this skill set. And you go higher for this skill set and oh, no, actually now we're pivoting back this way. So it's it's not the right time to hire your pre-product market fit. You want to make sure that you're, you're post-product market fit. The other thing is uh, making sure that you have at least 15 hours of tasks per week. If you can think of 10 to 15, you actually have 20 to 25. Um, but if you can't think of, um, if you can only think of 10 or, or less tasks, it's not going to be a good idea to outsource yet. And the reason being is, think about it. If, if you're hiring somebody for 10 hours a week, for them to fill their time full, uh, a full work schedule, they might have three or four other bosses. If they have three or four other bosses, they're not loyal to any one particular boss. And um, you're not going to be able to get access to them when you need them. Yeah, they're working two and a half hours a day. But what if their shift was at nine o'clock to 1130 and you have something that comes up at 1230? Well, you can't get access to them until tomorrow. It's just not very smooth and it's going to cause you more headache and it's really not worth the cost. So making sure that you have enough tasks is the key thing. Uh, next, uh, make sure that you have a budget of at least 800 bucks a month. Um, you know, for us, we do have a, a 20 hour minimum requirement for founders. That's what is the minimum that we've seen success. We have actually changed our, our rule on a couple of people and we've allowed them to have 10, 10 hours a week. It's never worked out, not for, for the founder, for, for us, you know, we're willing to do that, but it's not a win-win for the founder and they end up actually losing. So making sure that you have steady work means that you're going to have a stable VA and then you can start giving more things and making sure that you have a budget that is high enough. If you're really cutting the edge on the budget, it's like, gosh, if they don't produce an ROI on month one of prospecting, or I'm, 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 I have no more budget for that, you're going to get skittish and you're not going to make the right decisions in training them for things that are going to take more time to get an ROI. And you're not going to see an ROI on that. And all of a sudden you just wasted a month of training and a month budget that probably should have been allocated there. So I always say, make sure that you have probably three months to get an ROI. If you have three months to get an ROI, what you start doing is you're going to delegate more hours of tasks to them because you're, you're going to give them more tasks that, yeah, this is only going to take you 10 minutes to do. So you're not going to want to outsource this. But then if you realize, but over the next three months, it's actually going to take me four hours to do it because of how many times it repeats. Okay, I'll take an hour to go ahead and delegate this task today. So, and, and just having that mentality switch, the funny thing is if, if you have the budget and the time to get an ROI in three months and you treat your VA like that from day one, you actually usually get an ROI in one month. Um, so it is really a, a key distinction in mindset that we've seen. Okay, now I've got some management tips for uh, when you have a virtual assistant. So this one comes from my co-founder, Tyler. Uh, you should never be busy when your VAs aren't. Um, there are so many things that you think, oh, I'm special, I'm the founder, only I can do this. That's simply not true. Uh, we've even you know, outsourced things. Our VAs run payroll. They run sales, marketing, um, the admin, uh, HR. There's, there's easy things to delegate and there's harder things to delegate. You start with the easier ones, but as you keep going, you get to the point where you realize there's really very, very, very few things that you cannot delegate to the right VA. Um, and you know to give more things when you find that you're busy and they're not. Uh, and that goes along with this next one is always have a task backlog and an upskill list. So there are gonna be times when you don't have the bandwidth to give them new tasks. You're just in meetings, you're on sales calls, et cetera. Make sure that they have a backlog of things that they can learn, skills that they can learn. I talked earlier on this call about uh, one of my first virtual assistants, her name is Hannah. And we uh, asked her, hey, what are you interested in learning? And she said, hey, I want to learn how to edit video. I want to learn how to do SEO. I want to learn. So we had this whole list of things and we went and we found uh, different um, YouTube videos, different Udemy courses. I even had her take a Facebook ads course. And she knew that when she had finished her tasks and if there was nothing else in her queue, uh, that she would just go and start learning more things, which now means I'm investing in her learning and she becomes more valuable because she can start doing more things. Uh, and then I don't feel like I'm losing any type of value that I'm paying for. So it's really a win-win. And uh, you know, finding somebody who is hungry and anxious to learn uh, and then giving them paid time to go learn those tasks, they absolutely love it too. So it's a really good uh, situation. Uh, okay, open communication decreases ghosting. Now, 
Philippines has all these amazing benefits when you're outsourcing to the to to that particular uh, country. But there is one huge negative side, and that's the culture uh, of ghosting. Um, one thing that you need to know is that uh, Filipinos are there's a bit of a power dynamic that is is very alive and well in that culture where management is seen as um, a little bit higher up, um, less approachable, and uh, out of fear, out of, um, I guess, maybe even a little bit of respect, uh, they don't question, they don't talk back. And this can be difficult. It's much more difficult with the lower skilled, especially the less um, capacity for speaking English uh, virtual assistants that we actually don't deal with on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. But especially if you're hiring people in the you know, four to, to eight dollars an hour range, this is so frequent this happens that you'll give them tasks. They will feel inadequate uh, to finishing those tasks. And then all of a sudden they get flustered and they get stuck and they don't want to ask you for help. And then they feel ashamed and they made a mistake and maybe they lost to a sale or something happened. And all of this works up in their head. And so they, they think, okay, well, I'm just done. And they, they slide away quietly. They don't tell you that they quit. They don't tell you that they are stuck. They just disappear. Well, to and you're just left uh, wondering what just happened. Uh, and sometimes they'll disappear more slowly where they're uh, giving you excuses of, hey, um, my aunt's in the hospital. Uh, I had a funeral. I uh, had a storm. I don't have internet. And if you start seeing two or three of these excuses stack up, <laughs> know that it's a ghosting issue where they're actually feeling inadequate at their role. Um, and so whenever you, you, you have that happen, you want to open up a dialogue with your virtual assistant and let them know, hey, it's, it's okay to make mistakes. We are not uh, here to punish you. Um, and when they make their first mistake, you need to really praise them um, and help them understand that you care about them and care about learning them in a way that they might not have the experience in their past um, uh, roles at companies. Filipino managers sometimes are uh, maybe a little bit abrasive. Sometimes they work for other uh, bosses from Japan, from uh, Indonesia, from different countries, that they are treated as very expendable, especially in the corporate uh, mindset. Everybody is replaceable. You make one mistake, you are on probation, and you've got screen tracking, and you have all of these things, and it's not it's not a relationship of trust. And so it, the, the, the interesting thing is, though, when you have that issue with your VA, that very first issue that, that happens a big one where a big mistake's made, if you are over benevolent, if you're over supportive of them and understanding and open to them, that can actually be like a, a button to put them in hyperdrive because they realize that, wow, they didn't threaten me. And wow, they they value me and they're, they're investing more training into me. I think I'm actually going to stay here. I want to stay here forever. And now you, you're able to get them aligned with your vision and the loyalty that you get from having a rocky moment with your VA uh, is, is really altering in, in, in the relationship you have it, and it means that you're never going to have that problem again. So um, it just goes from you know, talking about good culture and actually implementing with that good culture. Okay, and then uh, golden rule here. Uh, this is the golden rule with all virtual assistants is you should never feel frustrated. If you ever feel frustrated with your virtual assistant, it's time to get a new virtual assistant. Uh, it might seem kind of harsh, but it is the gut feeling that has worked every single time. A hundred, we've 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 hired uh, probably almost hundred VAs now, and that is the biggest rule I can tell anybody: stick to this always. Why? Well, frustration is a very particular word that describes when you have attempted multiple times to explain something. It's not like they made one mistake and you've, you've explained it, so you're not gonna get frustrated. You might get um, you know, a little bit uh, upset that, oh, this mistake was made, but you're not gonna get frustrated. Frustration happens when there's some type of communication issue and you try to explain to them multiple times and you're still not getting the output that you're looking for. And it's usually something that, that either they don't have the communication skills, they don't have the job skills, maybe they are moonlighting and they actually have two or three other employers at the same time that you don't know about. Um, and that's why they're not coming to work on time. It, it can be a plethora of things, but if you ever feel frustrated, there's something there and you might not be able to put your finger on it, but it's time to go ahead and uh, search for a new virtual assistant. 
Okay, and then lastly, don't be afraid to change typical processes to fit remote virtual assistants. <clears throat> I think a lot of people are used to processes changed now that uh, COVID has happened and we've been working from home, we're not in the office, um, just a lot of the norms have changed. Heighten that now when you're working with virtual assistants. One example that I that I have that I'll share with this is uh, in our sales calls. I'm the, I'm the I'm the co-founder. I'm the visionary. I'm the CEO. Nobody can can spit vision like I can on how this is a win-win situation and, and and how you're able to bless your life, your family's life, getting your time back, giving all the opportunity to these virtual assistants, and it just it works so well. Nobody's quite as good as the founder at explaining those things. But I don't need to be on a sales call in order to share that. Because if I'm on a sales call sharing that with, with potential customers, what ends up happening is now I'm their point of trust. I'm the point of customer service on that relationship. And so now I become a bigger bottleneck the more sales we have because those customers are coming to me because I was the one on the sales call. And it, it's just like an, an, uh, a, a bad cycle of more and more time lost, the more sales you have. And so one example that, that we've used is changing our processes up. If you go on a sales process uh, with my account executive, Judy, which honestly, if anyone wants to do that um, just as a learning experience on how we switch up sales processes, uh, it's it's a no pressure thing. We're not going to hound you and um, try to, we actually tell 50% of our clients that have cash in hand, hey, we're not going to sell a virtual assistant service to you because you're not ready. And because we we actually, we've set things up so that we lose more money in the beginning so that it's in our best interest that if it's going to be a long-term relationship, we do it. If it's not, we don't. But with that, uh, go on a, on a sales call with Judy and you'll see that we actually change up the, the structure so that she builds rapport with the customer. And before she jumps into things, she says, I would like to show a, a message that we have from our, our founder that uh, he wanted to share with you, but he's not able to be on today's call. And it, it jumps over to a three minute uh, video where I share the vision and I say, this is why we started the company. This is the, the principles behind it. If you know this about our company and how we've uh, acted with difficult situations, outsourcing can be messy. I can't promise you that it's going to be perfect, but I can promise you that we're going to have really good customer service. And when stuff happens that's bad, we're always going to put you first instead of us. And here's how we've done that before. Doing that, it allows them to see the passion, the vision of the founder, and they get excited. And after that call or after that, that video, then my account executive is able to go through the different packages, the different options, and um, they have that trust, that that win-win. So again, it's a very strange process. You probably have never been on a sales call where you've had a message from a founder in that sales call, but it is the best thing we could have ever done for conversion because you're now able to use your superpower as a, as a founder and express that vision, but not get involved in the customer service and the delivery of uh, that value of, of that, that product. Okay, so uh, I think that actually brings us to uh, the end of our webinar. So we'll do a Q&A in a second. Um, now for, I guess, our, our little pitch on Coconut VA. Our whole brand, why we're called Coconut VA, is because we, we looked at every other brand and we said, everything's so boring. It's so robotic. It's so business professional stock websites for virtual assistant services. And that's not who we are. That's not who founders are. We don't resonate with that. And so we thought, what is, what is the, the antithesis of success that we all resonate with? And it's taking your vacation, you're taking your laptop on vacation. We've asked hundreds of founders, how many of you have to take your laptop on vacation? And it's like 95% of people do because they have to put fires out. They're bottlenecks in their systems. They can't actually relax and uh, decompress with their family. So we looked at it and said, okay, well, then what is success? Success is going on vacation without your laptop. And we've actually really implemented that at Coconut VA. So we started um, just over a year ago. Uh, as founders, we've gone on over six months of vacation in that time because we've used vacations as strategic tests of bottlenecks. So the whole idea is that you, as the founder, do an operations process, you create a system for it, you know, hire somebody and you train them on that system. But if you are still in the company, they're always gonna be dependent on you whenever they have issues. And you have to be away from the company for them to fully be autonomous. Just like kids have to leave the nest and, and go out to college and make their own mistakes. 
your virtual assistants have to be on their own, have to be forced to use their own uh, intellect to solve these issues. And so what we do is we, we force that by going on vacation. So uh, we've done that, um, I've, I've done it I think about six times. Uh, my co-founder Tyler's done it about four times where we get systems all up and ready, we hand that off, and then we go off on anywhere from a, a one week to I've gone for four months uh, of vacation. And we have different rules where we say, hey, you can contact me if the cost of a mistake of my not replying to this is gonna cost double of what my vacation value is. So let's say it's a $3,000 vacation, then that better be a $6,000 mistake because you're probably gonna ruin your my vacation if, if you have to reach out to me. So we set that limit and they don't contact you unless it reaches that limit. And guess what? I've been doing this for a year now and I've never actually been contacted. So it's, it's a pretty good foolproof system. Um, but then when you come back from vacation, you find out, oh, look, here are a couple of minor bugs. Oh, I, I got to give you a couple of different trainings. Now that's off your plate and that's off your plate forever. As a founder, you go do the next task and you hire, you hand off higher and higher tasks to the point where eventually you don't have a job, which um, is what the goal is of entrepreneurship. So um, that's our, our vision, our goal. That's, that's everything that we support. It's, it's our branding. As far as our particular solution, um, we're very found, founder friendly. So we don't have any hiring fee. Uh, a lot of agencies will charge $500 on up for a hiring fee. We charge zero because it's a lot of risk for you in the beginning and you don't know if it's going to work, but we know if it's going to work. So let's put it in our interest to only have it work if it's going to be a long-term win-win. Uh, we don't have long-term contracts. A lot of agencies will try to get you in a three-month contract because it's quite expensive to go through the hiring process. Um, for us, we say, hey, let's limit, instead of three months, let's go down to a 20-hour, one-week trial. And so for $250, uh, we will do all of the vetting. We will find the best candidates. We'll do the interviews. We'll send you the top three. You get to watch these 60-second intro videos. And from there, um, you get to pick who you'd like to move on to the final interviews where you're gonna be on. We co-moderate that interview with you. We go into a Zoom breakout room. We ask you your thoughts. What are your concerns? We'll share with you. Would we actually hire this VA for our organization? And we will not let you go forward with the VA that we would not hire for our organization. And so we get to that point. And if you wanna go ahead and pull the trigger, then it's just $250 to uh, do a 20 hour trial period with them. And then after that, um, we do the legal, we do the payroll, and then we provide the benefits um, for a monthly subscription. And so it's just the, the VA's hourly rate and everything's built into that. Um, and as I mentioned before, we provide our, our virtual assistants with uh, healthcare, with, um, uh, it's called 13 month bonus. So it's a retention bonus at the end of the year. They get an extra month's salary, uh, which is really sticky and, and making sure that our VAs don't ghost you. Uh, making sure that um, there's a, a line of open communication. We have profit sharing. Um, we have uh, dedicated 50% of our, our uh, profits once the founders have a, a 10x ROI towards our virtual assistants. And, and with that, they have stock or share in a million dollar profit sharing pot for uh, the VAs for our first uh, 500 virtual assistants. So all of these things solve the biggest problem that you have with virtual assistants with this churn. Um, and when you do that, you now can uh, train virtual assistants to be in your organization long term, even more long term than, than you would experience in the States. But it's at a cost that's half the cost. Uh, so it's it's really, you know, a one of a kind win win situation that I'm super proud of that, that we've created and um, definitely find a lot of purpose and mission in it. Uh, and lastly, here's the, the prices that we have. Um, so it's really you know ten to sixteen dollars an hour, uh, typically for for these roles. Um, we do have a twenty hour minimum, um, and with that, you know each role goes from starter. It's it's somebody with decent English, uh, written English at least. They probably have a bit of an accent. Uh, they've got fast internet. They can work U.S. hours. They have prior VA experience. It's gonna be more of the prospecting, data chat, basic operations roles. Going into the grower, it's at twelve bucks an hour plus. They're going to have uh, not only good written English, but good spoken English. Um, they're going to have a, a, um, usually about three plus years of VA experience. They're very good at learning new skills and they can operate things. Um, common rules, general admin, customer service, social media operations, et cetera. Uh, scalar, this is probably one of our, our more popular virtual assistants at 14 uh, an hour. And that's going to be somebody who is more autonomous. It's a big step up here. Um, think of this as being somebody around 30 bucks an hour in the States. Uh, they can create pro processes. 
Uh, they can lead teams. They have experience leading teams. They're much more proactive and they can attend client calls typically on a supportive role. Maybe they're taking notes. Maybe they're doing the customer service on uh, that process, but they're, they're more customer facing. Um, common roles, ops management, executive assistance, project management, system creation, et cetera. And then our final tier is, is pro and it, you can go anywhere, you know, $16 an hour. And if you're trying to find something, somebody extremely specialized, um, you know, it, it can go up from that and we can just open it up to whatever, uh, whatever price is going to meet the demand for, for that talent uh, to make sure that's going to be something that's going to be solid for you long-term. But you can really get people, um, you might have heard my executive assistant, Donna, before, I, like I said, she's probably going to be the, the CEO one day of this company. Perfect U.S. accent, um, can lead client calls. Um, my uh, uh, executive assistant, uh, or sorry, um, my uh, account executive, uh, Judy, she runs all of her sales calls. Um, they have specialty skills um, anywhere from SDR, account executives, top op tools and specialties. So um, I hope that you understand, I guess, from this call, that the question is not what can a VA do? It's more, what can't a VA do? There are very, very few things. I would I'd be bold and say that there is nothing that a, a virtual US uh, employee uh, can do that a virtual assistant could not do. Uh, and it's typically about half the price. Um, so uh, with that, um, if you would like to learn more about Coconut VA, I think we're gonna be sending uh, an email tomorrow um, with uh, this presentation. Uh, you will also have access to um, our link. I think the deal that we're having is um, there's the, the $250 trial. Uh, and if you convert, uh, you get $100 off your first month uh, subscription. Um, and so that's a little bit of a bonus for sticking through this webinar. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be uh, happy to answer those. Just pop them in the chat and um, I will go ahead and start going through that. All right, so um, are you going to set up the presentation afterwards? Yes, you should get that in an email tomorrow. Um, okay, question. Speaking of screen tracking, whether online jobs, PH, or any VA agency, I'm wondering to what extent is standard for keylogger slash screen recording to be used? Is it expected on their end? If someone is working for us in our office, uh, we can visually see their desk and get a sense if they're truly working or not. Without that ability, how are we assured that they're doing the work we're paying them to do? Uh, that's a really good question. So is it a common thing to use screen trackers and key logging? Uh, yes, that I would say that is a common thing that um, people have had experience with. Is it something that they like doing? Absolutely not. <laughs> so I would say it's, uh, it's a cultural thing. Um, first off, you should never have a virtual assistant that you cannot trust. Uh, that they're doing their work, um, that you need to monitor them with any type of screen logging or screen tracking. It is extremely uh, depressing, restrictive, and um, just demoralizing to be on a screen tracker. Uh, I've, I've tried one out myself and it, it feels like you're stealing time from your company and like they think you were dishonest and every single log that you have on is being tracked. Pair this with the fact that they're working for you in the middle of the night by themselves in some dark room. And it's just, it just gives off a wrong vibe. RVAs hate screen tracking, screen logging, not because they're dishonest, but just because it's it's such a, a terrible culture. So we actually do not do any screen tracking or screen logging unless a VA gets on probation. So if their client feels like, hey, we're not getting the value out of this VA, then yeah, we will put them on, on, on a, a screen tracker for a two week period. And if they're proving that they're doing the, the work then they get you know pulled off that, that probation, they get pulled off that screen tracking. And if screen tracking comes that, hey, they're not providing the value, well, then we're gonna be replacing with a different virtual assistant, but you should always give them the trust. And when they prove that they don't deserve the trust, that's when you're taking it away um, from a cultural perspective. Again, this comes from my bias and we, one of the things why we work with really top virtual assistants is because I, I, I went to Manila and our TikTok blew up. We, we have over 20,000 Filipino followers on our TikTok. We got thousands of applications. We went out every single job from, uh, is Coconut VA offer versus a different offer? We always went because we have better benefits. We have better packages. You can't beat us. 
So because of that, we do get this bias where we're working with top talent that is motivated to stay with us long-term and doesn't cheat us and, and all these things. So I will say, discount that if you're doing this on your own. Um, but yeah, VAs hate it and um, they have had experience with it. It is something that is common, but it's it's a toxic culture. And I would suggest trying to find other ways to measure uh, their impact. One thing we have them do is we, it's kind of like a Clockify app at the beginning of their shift and at the end of the shift. They go ahead and log in, but it's not a micromanagement of every single action. It's a really good question. I really appreciate you bringing that up. Okay. Um, I have a non-toxic uh, oil distribution company. We sell to personal care company, uh, food companies, makeup companies, et cetera. How can your company provide services to us? Uh, so sales and service appointments. Um, I would say hop on a on a call with Judy and she can uh, walk you through some of those uh, tasks um, more on a, on a personal basis. But yeah, I mean, it's what are things that are repeatable processes that uh, you're going to be doing, whether it's sales calls, whether it's customer service, whether it's the billing, whether it's the sourcing, uh, all of those things are things that you could hire a U.S. employee for, something that you can hire a virtual assistant for. Okay, we've got another question. Um, okay, so please email Judy's telephone number. Um, let's give you, uh, Liza, could you give the Slack link, or sorry, the uh, uh, Zoom link to schedule with uh, Judy here in the chat? And um, if anybody okay. would like, also just hopping on that call with Judy, she's gonna ask you how you heard about us. Um, and that's how she'll know to make sure she applies that $100 discount to your, your first month. So no worries on uh, what link that you have to click on. There's not a special affiliate link. Uh, okay, um, so relative to hiring freelancers from Fiverr and these websites or hiring virtual employees who live in the U.S., could you speak to the legalities, taxes, regulations, differences one can expect compared to hiring in the U.S.? Not sure what the learning curve would be if we hire someone from another country. Okay, um, as people always say, I'm not a lawyer, um, I'm not an accountant, and so please go uh, talk with a lawyer and an accountant on uh, these things. Um, that being said, if you are working with people from foreign countries, uh, my opinion is it can actually be a little bit easier. Uh, and the reason why is uh, there's no US social security and uh, employment tax that uh, needs to be paid because they're not US citizens. Um, the trend is it's been a little bit murkier when you're having a US person who uh, acts like an employee uh, and really actually isn't an independent contractor that uh, isn't such a gray area when you're uh, hiring foreign. Um, so when you're hiring outside of the States, um, there's usually an NDA, there's an independent contractor agreement. And again, these are all agreements that, that we take care of for you, make sure that everything's signed for you. Um, and then there's something called a W-8 Ben, and that's going to be just a, a tax form that your virtual assistant um, promises that they're going to handle the taxes uh, with their local government. Uh, in the Philippines and make sure that that happens. So there's no obligation that you have to pay taxes um, on your to your virtual assistants or to that foreign country. Um, and so it's actually uh, fairly simple. Um, as far as uh, in the US when you're hiring virtual assistants, I won't speak to that so much because the legalities and, and what I um, can speak on are a little bit different, um, but Typically, if they are an independent contractor, uh, they should be, again, signing and, and paying their own taxes, though you can, um, you do need to be careful because if if they come to you and say, hey, I'm not actually an independent contractor, I'm really an employee, um, there's issues with tax taxes and stuff that um, are concerns to be aware of. Um, so hopefully that answers your questions as much as I can answer it. Okay, uh, any other questions that uh, we have on virtual assistants before we wrap up? We've got a couple more minutes. Okay, in terms of making a uh, list making events, finding vendors, I mean, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's something that, um, an entry level BA can do. Uh, yeah, we we have, I, like, 
if you have, hey, here's a list of trade shows that we've attended and we want you to go Google more, they're very good at Googling. And so um, we've, we've had that with, hey, here's webinars that we want to attend, here's trade shows we want to attend. And um, you just give them you know, a couple of good ones and then they can go fill out an Excel list and do a lot of research for you. Um, I do have one real quick, funny online research uh, experience that I had with one of my virtual assistants. Uh, I was looking to um, create a product uh, in China. And so I had my virtual assistant take one of the courses that I had on outsourcing. So she learned how to source for manufacturers, how to get uh, quotes, how to um, get uh, molds done from people on Fiverr, all that. So she learned that this on her own. I just gave her access to a course. And um, I said, hey, here's this Instagram uh, you know, business that is making um, this, uh, it's called a bath bean. It's like a suction cup silicone thing that sits in the, the bottom of a bathtub. And so women that are short, that their feet can't touch them in the bathtub, they don't slip uh, down the bath. And so I said, they're selling this thing for $100. Like I'm sure we could you know, manufacture these and sell them for 30 and, and make a huge profit. And um, so I, I had my, my, my VA go in and do this research. And so she does the course and she, she learns, okay, I've got to go get a mold, um, a, a quote. So she gets somebody on Fiverr, all without me asking, uh, find somebody who's going to create the CAD design. But then I, I, at the end of the day, I get a couple of Slack messages um, that I didn't catch up on. And I look at her Slack messages and she says, hey, Eric, um, I have a couple of questions. What is the uh, size of the suction cups on this? Next message. Never mind. I'm on the uh, Instagram account and I'm DMing the competitor company and they let me know that it's 2.5 inches. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like great on you for like carrying this out, but like we probably shouldn't. And then I look at the next message it says, I need to know what the radial uh, degree of the suction cups are. Never mind. Uh, this, this company has, has helped me figure out what the radial degree is and they sent me a schematics of it. And she sent this over to this guy and like finished this project. And I'm at the end of the day, I'm like, okay. Thank you so much for being proactive and thank you so much for, um, you know, not bothering me with these things and, and using uh, your resources, but we should probably, you know, stick with information that's publicly available instead of uh, going behind people's backs. So uh, I think that this is just a little cute story to show how resourceful uh, they are in um, doing online research. So uh, thanks for bringing that question. Okay, we've got two minutes. Does anyone have any last uh, questions before we hop off here? Okay, so if not, um, we have in the link, uh, if you'd like to schedule a strategy call, um, we've just posted that. And um, yeah, I just wanna thank everybody for coming on this call. Uh, if you have any questions, um, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's just Eric Espinosa, type in Coconut VA. I post a couple times a day, so you'll see me. Um, if you're interested in uh, a virtual assistant, of course, hop on our website, just go ahead and book a call. Uh, if you're just interested in, um, founder lifestyle content uh, in following our vacation laptopless brand. Um, you can go ahead and uh, go on our website, sign up for a newsletter where we give tips and uh, help you live the digital nomad lifestyle and get out of the nine to five and have uh, the freedom to do uh, what you like and, and kind of back you and the reason why you started entrepreneurship. So uh, thank you so much for joining and uh, hope that everyone has a, a good evening and uh, we'll stay in touch. Hey, yes, sir. I just noticed uh, that you've got your phone number in here. We'll make sure that we give you a call.